Welcome to the South Florida Book Festival. It is the 10th annual South Florida Book Festival that is taking place at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. So I'm going to welcome my guests, Mr. Akbar Watson and Mr. Fikere Wilson. Mr. Akbar is a book proprietor and Mr. Wilson is a book publisher. He has a publishing house by the name of Educa Vision. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Today's topic we are working with is Black bookstores surviving and thriving in the digital era. We all know how serious this topic is. So before I get started, let me introduce Mr. Akbar. Mr. Akbar James Watson is the owner and director of Pyramid Books Incorporated, located in Boynton Beach, Florida. Pyramid Books was one of the largest African-centered bookstores in the country. The store specialized in providing books-related mate books related materials, I'm sorry, books and related materials that enhance knowledge of the African diaspora. Mr. Watson has been in business for over 25 years and has become a major source of information about the African and African-American ethos. Mr. Watson has secured book material contract with the US government, the state of Florida, numerous school districts, libraries, and others who vie for his services. Mr. Watson has received numerous awards and citations for his leadership and mentorship with South County youth and adults. Some of these awards include the NAACP Economic Leadership Award, the Delta Sigma Theta Men of Excellence Award, and the Keepers of the Dream Award from the Oscar Thomas Foundation and Nova Southeastern University. Mr. Akbar, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Mr. Fikere Wilson is a publisher, author, lexographer, molecular biologist. Mr. Wilson was born in IT and began his early education there. After high school, he, man he migrated to Montreal, Canada, where he studied biology at Concordia University. Then went on to graduate school in Quebec City, University Laval, and, on, and in Medford, Massachusetts at Tufts University, obtaining advanced degrees in biochemistry and biotechnology, respectively. Mr. Wilson's early career as a researcher focused on renewable energy, science at McGill University, and aquaculture infrastructure evaluation, where they studied fish, shrimp, and algae in Haiti and the Caribbean. He later moved to Florida to work at the University of South Florida in the medical school's biochemistry and molecular biology department. At USF, he did research on metabolism of cholesterol in the liver using rat liver as a model. This groundbreaking research at the Kennedy Keller Laboratory would later lead to the development of successful medicine to control cholesterol in humans. In 1991, Mr. Wilson started Edua, Educa Vision Incorporated, a publishing company that develops and publishes bilingual educational material in Haitian Creole, English, and French. Mr. Wilson speaks French, English, Haitian Creole, Spanish, and reads German and Portuguese. He started the company while still a researcher at the University of South Florida, and eventually left, left USCF to expand EVI, his book publishing company. Presently, Mr. Wilson devotes his time to curriculum development, publishing of educational materials in Haitian Creole, teacher training, lexography, and consultancy with the Ministry of Education in Haiti and other organizations. He is also founding member of the Académie Creole Aïssen. Did I say that correctly? 
Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson and Mr. Akbar for being here. I would like to first start with Mr. Akbar. What, what encouraged you or what was the reason behind you becoming a book, a book uh, store owner or proprietorship as opposed to being a publisher? Oh, wow. So, um, wow, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think uh, I, I got in the business because of my passion towards books. And I saw a big deficit, uh, especially in relationship to uh, black men or men of color in relationships to books. And also books being, at least the books that I was passionate about being hard to find. So a couple of people that I used to read with, uh, they just singled me out to be able to get the books to have available for them, literally out of the back, back of my car. And then voila, it just muffed into a, uh, accidentally uh, backed into the business of bookselling. So um, I later developed over the years into a publisher where I do publish uh, select few copies of books. Uh, and mostly they're celebrities and uh, mainstream authors uh, that just gave me the right to publish their books. But that came later on as I morphed into the business. The topic that we are dealing with, um, surviving and thriving in the digital age. I recall a few years ago, and this could be applied both to uh, Mr. Vincent as well as you, when um, I had a friend who also had a bookstore, very thriving in Atlanta. And then we had these mega bookstores that came in the scene, Borders and, and um, I forget the other one, but Borders was the main one that came on the scene and automatically most of the bookstores in that area included that small bookstore went out of business. How has that affected you when you had these mega bookstores that came on the scene and sort of control the market for a minute. Did that affect your bookstore? Well, yes and no. First of all, let's, let's recognize that we're in, the system that we're operating in is capitalistic. It's brutal and it's cutthroat. Um, and book business is no exception to the rule. Um, I think the, the industry realized that a niche market that a lot of us black booksellers that were into, they realized that it was an opportunity to capitalize on it. And 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 this is this has been done, this was done from the uh, uh, back into the uh, Harlem Renaissance um, where major uh, retailers tried to capitalize on the consciousness of uh, black community so yes uh they were able to buy books at um they they worked with the major publishers the simon and schuster penguin random house Mute mifflin and so forth to saturate and dominate the market and uh this is nothing new it's just all areas of uh industry in america has been um it's about conglomerizing and so we just happen to be stopped in this process of, of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And a lot of us uh, uh, were able to survive it by, uh, I don't know, staying true to principles, staying true to the principles and the art of book selling and uh, not being so much into the, the, the notion of making money. Of course, all of us want to make money in the process, but I think the passion towards, I think most of us, in the, as far as black booksellers, we had a passion towards uh, bookselling industry. Would you say that you are above that fray now? Um, are you in a position to continue going on successfully? Because I realized that even Barnes and Nobles 
and borders have also gone out of business and you have survived and bookstores like yours have survived. Yeah, I, th I think the both came with us with this, um, I think we had a major boost with, the, with this uh, stuff that happened with uh, George Floyd and the Trayvon, that the climate had started to change. And we started to focus mostly online. And um, the business has really, really flourished because um, Americans, all Americans are just, I think, they're sick and tired of the frustration of the how the system is working. So I think uh, 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 America is making revolutionary stands and focusing and reaching out uh, on black business in general or black bookstores in particular. And uh, it has really, um, I, I, it just, uh, it's been a real game changer for me. Very good. Mr. Phil Santa, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. And I'm gonna start with a similar question to you. Why didn't you go into bookstore uh, proprietorship as opposed to publishing? Well, when I started, the bilingual educational material publishing space did, it, did not include Haitian and Haitian Creole. So, in order to sell those books, they have to be published. So I think publishing for me was a logical starting point. First, to make them available and then seek space to sell them. Personally, I have, like Mr. Akbar, I have a serious affection for books. When I was a kid, I did not have books in Haitian Creole. I wanted to read them, but they were not available. There were a lot of book in, books in French, but they were not necessarily available to me, although I have access to them. And some of them written by Haitians were forbidden because they had ideas that the political situation found that those ideas were, should not be read by kids because they were a little bit too social conscious and uh, critical of government. So I had to hide to read them. So this kind of emotional connection to books I grew up with and when I came here and I was working as a biologist. I went to schools regularly to speak to the kids to tell them about what a biologist do in life so that they could eventually uh, uh, adopt or select this field of work in their lives. And it is when I was there that I realized there was not many books for them. And there were no place to buy them. So I make the rational and simplistic decision to make them and then go back to see if I can sell them. How has, how has the, the, the market, for instance, you are coming up against a lot of publishing houses that are very well financed, uh, controlling the market in a, in a serious way. How have you been able to be successful at what you do, given that cutthroat market we call publishing? I don't know if I'm successful, however. <laughs> you are I speaking could... to me. So <laughs> I, I... I think it's important that you are here, Mr. Akbar, so you are successful in some way. <laughs> I think it's, a, as Mr. Akbar indicated, it's, a, it's both a passion and a discipline to continue to be to to exist. So I am having triple pleasure. One is that I'm doing something that is I, I want to do. I am passionate and motivated to do. And also I am very meticulous and sometimes very disciplined to make sure that it pays for itself. And third, I am in a space 
as you said, capitalistic space, I have to make sure that it fit itself too. And finally, that the kids find pleasant book that connect to their reality, to their culture, to their language, to their music, to their cooking. So I take all this into consideration and therefore I have to look at different strategy, market strategies and market functions, both in the bi bilingual and also bicultural and also uh, integration into the American way of life, either through culture, through uh, creativity, through criticism, through, through self, uh, exploration and also spirituality. So I have to touch all this pretty much like you do, Akbar, to in order to be present and to do it with pleasure. So now I take it over to, uh, you want to add something, Mr. Akbar? Yeah, I, I think what the brother said was very, very, very important. And I think it was uh, really heavy. So there has been a targeted, there has been, a, it, it's been targeted. And, and he, 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 I like what he said. He says about the availability, about how the, he was talking about positive characters in books. There has been a deliberate effect to target black people or black men in particular when it comes to reading and literature. For example, at a time, it was a time when, 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 when people were enslaved, they were forbidden to read and write. And there's a lot of statues that we can pull up now, South Carolina, uh, uh, Virginia, uh, 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 North Carolina, about the punishment, what would happen if one was caught teaching uh, uh, a person enslaved to read and write. And, and we can read about those punishments. And it, were, it was anywhere from fines to imprisonment to actual physical whippings on the, on the backs. And these statues, you st we still can find. And, and let, let me go, let, let me say something that I like what he said also. He talked about publishing books with positive characters. There was a deliberate attempt and that attempt is still happening today to paint negative images of black men when it comes to literature. And those negative images that has been implanted into the minds of people, especially young black boys coming into the books, a lot of times they're not even aware of it. So for example, he mentioned positive images. I know when I was growing up, one of the first books that was popular and still on the market today was Little Black Sambo. And when children read books like that, they, admit, they, they immediately made fun of each other about it, not knowing what they're doing, but those books were intended to do that, to encourage black boys in particular not to develop a relationship with books. You had Little Black Sambo, you had uh, Tin Tin that was happening in Haiti and French, you had uh, 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 books, uh, and it was this was happening across the world, not just in America. So there, yeah, there has always been a, a, a concerted effort to deny intellectual development uh, amongst black boys and men in books. And I'll say one more thing, and and then I'll I'll, I'll shut up. You know, one of the first American writers on literature was Mark Twain. And black people were never introduced in no American literature prior to Mark Twain or Harriet Beecher Stowe. When Mark Twain dropped his book, the first time black people had an identity, positive or negative, it came through the character of nigger Jim in Huckleberry Finn. Now, before that, we were never identified in literature. And Mark Twain was the first American to identify 
black people in literature. And when he did identify him, he identified as the word nigger Jim. Ernest Hemingway said this, and I think it was 19, if I'm not mistaken. At any rate, Ernest Hemingway made a statement. Ernest Hemingway said, all American literature comes from Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn. Now imagine the impact that that would have on the minds of people that are introduced to literature up until today. Not only black, but black and white. So Mark Twain came before uh, Harriet uh, Beaker Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, correct? Yeah, and let, let me also, let me, they were pretty much around the same time. Let me mention, let me, since you meant, uh, we mentioned in Harriet Beecher Stowe, let me tell you what, let me tell you what, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you about the impact. And I think the brother was talking about how the impact of the books were with him. They also impacted me. So Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Uncle Tom, that character in that book was so impacting on the minds of Americans that it is with us today. And that was, at the time, that was one of the most hot-selling books of all times. The only one that was outdating that was the Bible. Now, think of that level. And that character, Uncle Tom, it had become a, 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 a negative connotation that we use today. And it was direct, di uh, directly derived out of that book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And let me say one more thing, because I, I just love books. And I, and, I, and I see the damages that was done through American literature through the psyche of black boys today. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, there was a character by the name of Simon Laguerre. Simon Laguerre, he was the one that beat Uncle Tom in the book. And I, rec I encourage people to reread the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And the reason why I mention that there was a guy that wrote a book called The Leopard Spot. And he, I think it, it, the name of him was, uh, it was Thomas Dixon. He wrote a book titled Le Leopard Stop, the, the Leopard Spot. He took the character out of Harriet Beecher Stowe by the name of Simon Laguerre. And it became the character because he wanted to big up that particular character and he wrote a book called A Leopard Spot to glorify the Ku Klux Klan. He wrote two books. The Leopard Spot, his name is Thomas Dixon. He wrote two books, The Leopard Spot and another book called The Klansman. The reason why he was so important because that book that he titled The Klansman, because America was trying to put a patriotic face on Ku Klux Klan. The book that he titled The Klansman later on to become came to become adopted into a motion picture because a lot of books are motion pictures. And I'm hoping that some of the brother books that he's publishing in the Duke Division become motion pictures because we need to hit it from all angles. But the book that he adopted to the motion picture was named The Klansman. That book, The Klansman, it formulated into a, a, a movie called The Birth, Birth of a Nation. It was the first full feature film that was played in the White House, and it was to glorify the Klansmen. Mr. Vincent, how has this new, I, I know, for example, how the electronic age has taken over, uh, how it plays a role in libraries. When, when magazines and books became, or to a certain extent, um, was introduced to the technology, it affected libraries in a serious way in terms of our collection development. The digitization has affected our archives and how we keep our records and how we maintain our records to the future. How has this affected your business as a publisher, the digitization of monographs of books and materials? We started offering digital materials, but so far it has very small impact in terms of sales. The sale is very limited, but I think the libraries 
develop strategies that keep small publishers out. The strategies are probably not developed by the libraries, but by the providers of, of probably by the big publisher because libraries only buy from well-known and big publisher and have, uh, and do not buy digital material from independent publishers. That could be, there are some exceptions because some libraries bought from us mostly not online, but digital material that are autonomous like CD, DVDs, uh, and interactive that are on plat on those platforms. But online, none. They all want to buy from maybe three or four big publishers. And they tell me, for example, if you get your books into those publishers, we will buy them. But when I go to those big, 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 but big publishers, they find us too small to do business with us. So in terms of digital to libraries, we are not in it, not because we don't develop, but because the market strategies and the market tactics make it very difficult for the libraries to buy from independent publishers. Um, so we we also take different route. We go to the um, Kindle. The Kindle market take us, but the sales have very a lot of limitation in price, so that we need to sell million to make money. But there is no million buyers, so the investment is not interesting because in, there are limit, price limitation. For example, something that would sell $1 to $5. So you need thousand and thousand and our market is very small. So the electronic online doesn't work for us except in language learning. We have some success in language learning because we are the only one offering Crayon online. So the schools, the universities, both in New York, Boston, and even the Bahamas, buy our books electronically to learn Asian color, and that's about it. That is so unfortunate. Mr. Akbar, how does the digitization of, um, affect your, your proprietorship of, of a bookstore? Okay, let me, let me, let me, I'm a, I'll tell you. The issue is systemic racism and it's in literature and it's following the path to the digital stage as far as books. So what's happening is if there is not that concerted effort to learn to read, when we move into the digital platform, and by the way, I do sell ebooks on my website, pyramidbooks.com. Front page, you can get ebooks. But what's happening with what's happening in the black community when it comes to the digital divide as far as literature is systemic racism. We're not developing the passion for books. So when we move over to the digital platforms in order to read, the young people are being they're, they're, they have a competition with Facebook, Instagram, texting. So these are driving them towards something other than literature or other than reading. I know I just, I, I, I took a, a, a effort to get into the arena and I think I read my first 500 page novel uh, digitally, I guess about maybe eight, nine, 10 years ago, just to make it official that I can read electronically. But I found the competition uh, on reading uh, uh, electronically or in a digital age, and the young readers that are on the market are overwhelmed with this, is constantly checking emails, texting friends. And so what we're doing is we're actually falling through the cracks 
when it comes to getting in the book industry uh, digitally. I'll say like the brother said, we had a strong surge in the beginning when everybody was going to the eBooks because they was new and people wanted to experience with it. Um, but we're finding out that that is starting to uh, flatten out also. And uh, it's that same old thing that was happening in the book industry. It's following over to the digital age and that's systemic racism. Well, I understand the role that systemic racism has played. What about what happens in the home with parents supervising and taking charge of what their children do at the micro level so that they can more or less be guided towards that time that they spend on these various uh, social media can be limited and refocused into something that would, they could learn from that would benefit them in the long term. I was, I was referring to uh, Mr. Akbar's statement. Um, I, I, think, I, think, I, think what, I think a lot of times what we, we want to do is talk about, I think, I, and, I, and I like what you said, by the way. The reason why I made the statement earlier, the parents are overwhelmed with these negative images. The parents are not reading themselves. So it's hard to trans that, translate that over to the kids. So what the parent would normally do is say, go pick up a book and read. But you, we have to remember children mimic the parents. If they're not seeing the parents read, they're not gonna read. And, and, and I'll say this too. A lot of the young, and I, I, I focus on boys because I, I, I like watching the boys and I work with a lot of young boys and when it comes to reading. A lot of them, they are outright rebelling when it comes to reading because they don't see that as an opportunity for them to succeed in life. And it's not that they can't read, it is just that they are rebelling against it because in a lot of the images that they're seeing, they're not seeing other males reading. So I think that when the parents are teaching the children, the children sometimes look at it as a, as a, as a form of punishment and no child wants to be punished. I think like uh, Farouk, I just happened to be fortunate enough where I had developed a passion for reading real early and that I was, was able to overcome a lot of the negative images that I saw in the book, which uh, I think a lot of boys are just not able to do that. And they're just not dealing with it. And I, I think the term is called a literature is where they're just outright rebelling against books. But yeah, there is a, a, a responsibility for it to start in the home, but one cannot teach nothing. One don't have the knowledge to teach. And we have to remember history is current events. Mr. Vincent, how do you see us, both libraries, bookstores and publishers, especially publishers that are in our community and trying to survive and to transcend the challenges. How can we work together to bridge this, uh, this divide? Sorry, I thought I was speaking, but I was muted. <laughs> that happened in life too. Well, they, we need to do an effort to attract good reader. And I think the effort should be done at all levels, but especially in the first three years of, of schooling. When the kids is between five and maybe nine or even 10, we have to do something. We, as Mr. Akbar described it, we know the problem, we see the result. Now we need to act. What kind of action we could take? There are many, but we have to look critically and see where we could find those kids and their parents. Where are they that they are accessible? I think they are in schools. The schools have libraries. We need to collaborate with the schools. They are at church. Some church have libraries. 
We need to go to the church. We need to speak with the pastor. We need to encourage the pastors. And not so much the publisher, but I guess the, 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 li the librarians has even a better lever to speak to the, to the community leaders, to the, especially the churches on the schools where the kids are, they are there. And the third place that they go is to the doctors, pediatricians. We need to do something. We have seen the problem. We have identified it that we need to take action. And those three spaces are very simple. The schools, the church, the pediatricians. The kids are there, they see the book, they touch the book, they look at the images. And at the beginning, they are curious about book. It's at one point in their evolution, they lost that interest. We need to do something critically, creatively, spiritually, socially, any lead that you want. But we have the responsibility to do something because the kids today who do not embrace reading, it doesn't matter what, it could be sport, could be art, it could be um, friends, and when they become uh, teenagers, it could be love. Anything that they're interested in, they should have material to it. But don't forget, reading is always associated with writing. Make it an association either through language or through art. Make it a pair. In, the, in some school, we have small little projects where students write and compete. Most of them are girls. Most of them are girls. So yes. we have to do something to make it not only a girl thing, but also a human thing, an expression, personal, affective, spiritual, or social. We have the responsibility to do it, be it from, from the library or from the bookstores or from the publishers or from the parents or the spiritual leaders. We need to collaborate to make it happen. And it's good business. It's always good. It's also good business. But if our kids do not embrace reading, they will be behind cognitively, affectively, socially, and also in their uh, success, success. We have to take the success into our hand today, especially because there are digital material that the kids could read independently. We need to embrace that independent and critical reading access, access so that we don't of course, there will be uh, there will be racism. Of course, we have to address it, understand it, fight it. But we also need to create critical people, artistic people that could change not only their life but the people around them. It is also our responsibility not only to identify the problem, not only to describe the problem, not only to explain the problem, but also to act on the problem. Mr. Akbar, can you add to that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I have been doing throughout the years um, is I have been reading to young boys as they come in the bookstore. So those young boys that I have been reading to, now they're 25, 30 years old, and they come back and talk to me about books. So I think another thing I do is I go into schools and I let them see me reading. I would read to them so they could see reading as being cool, reading as hip, 
breeding is sexy. It's breeding is a thing that, you know, I like to not only tell them to read, I read to them. And then as I'm reading to them, I'll start getting into talking about what I'm reading and I make it exciting. I make reading exciting. I make it thrilling because reading is exciting and thrilling. Another thing I would do too, if I go to different places where I see young boys that I would take pictures of men holding books and men reading books and just put those pictures around. Uh, I know an organization out of Fort Lauderdale, it calls Reading Pays More. And what this lady does is she sends texts out. She'll send a text out showing men reading to babies and men reading to young boys. And it's pictures of men reading. And then she would have contests about men reading and so forth and having other men taking pictures of themselves and sending out reading. I think that uh, one of the things that, uh, and I found it to be effective, uh, is that I do a lot of, uh, for years I've been tutoring adult males in reading. And uh, it gives an opportunity for us to engage in different materials or like current events. And so I, I think that instead of waiting for something to happen, I have been in the process of it and um, it has developed my reading uh, ability. So I think what it does is the more we engage into it as individuals, the more we create a radiation effect when, when more people are attracted to it. And I'll say this one last thing and I'll shut up. I don't go nowhere in a public setting, each time you see me in a public setting, I will have a book with me. So if I have to wait in line, I have to sit, I will read my book. And most likely nine out of 10 times, someone will come up to me and say, what are you reading? Now it gives me an opportunity to create that radiation effect and talk about what I'm reading. And people are always interested in something somebody else is reading. A lot of times it could be annoying but it's a good opportunity to promote something that I'm reading or to get to talk to someone about something that I'm reading. You know, it's amazing that um, both of you has um, alluded to my particular experience, why I fell in love with reading and why I fell in love initially is that I was read to in elementary school in Trinidad and Tobago. That's the first instance in which I fell in love, teachers would read to us. And we have a lot of programs like that in the schools. And then later on, I took it upon myself to start going to the libraries. Every Saturday morning, if I don't have anything else to do, I would go to the library, get my books and head home. So I started to read very early and it was encouraged in our school system. But later on as a teenager, there was a group of young men in my circle who read. And so we would exchange books and you exchange the book. And when you go to hand it back, they would ask you what you thought about the book. And there you go, you explain. And you didn't know that you were in a book club unofficially. You didn't know that you were given a report and a summary, but you would tell the person, well, you know, the book was this good. It was that, I didn't like it, whatever. And that kept with me until there's no accident. I end up being a librarian of, other, of all things. But that initial reading too, and then encouraging from there. The converse happened when I used to take my nephew to the library with me as a very young boy. When I left the country and came abroad to do my studies, his father never took him to the library. He never continued to read. Now he doesn't read as an adult. If I was still there, I probably, he would have been a reader today because I would have encouraged him to the point where he would have taken off on his own. So yes, um, all of what you all are saying is important for us to make sure that reading is truly fundamental in our community. And once we set those, or come up with these creative ways of encouraging each other to read, especially our young people, then by osmosis, it would be embedded in them or become inherent in them to continue reading and to encourage others. Akbar, your, Mr. Watson, your thing about walking with a book everywhere you go, I do that. 
If I have to wait in line, I, one of the reasons I don't like driving is because I can't read. When I used to be on the trains in New York, I had my bag of books that I used to knock out on the way back and forth. Always have a book. If I had to wait in line, I have a book, you see? So these are the kind of examples we can set. And I really appreciate um, your views and Mr. Wilson's views on how we could bridge this digital divide. So in the interest of time, I'll ask that uh, if there are any closing remarks and I will ask Mr. Wilson to go first and then Mr. Akbar to follow up, please. Well, there are many strategies to books. One of them is song lyrics. Another one is theater, play, small play. Uh, I find the kids enjoy play, take, read something, and then do a little theater, classroom, or home theater, or church theater, and do a performance in, in front of their family or in front of, of, of the church. So although we are encouraging reading, um, the leader, the parent, uh, the teacher, the librarian should also use other strategies such as little play, short play, to encourage reading and develop the thought of independent learning. Thank you, Mr. Ak Mr. Watson. Okay, and in, in closing, let's, let, let me say this. I appreciate the form that you're having. Uh, I will say this, we on this form in the reading community, we are an exception to the rule and we need to be aware of that. Uh, the relationship with black men and books it is like, um, it's, it, it is something that needs to be promoted. And I appreciate you for having this form because I think the relationship with black men with books needs to be shown. Now, in saying that, I will go back and say there was a concerted effort to shield us and it was a war placed on us with books. There's billion dollar institutions with characters. Some of the leading characters are in, in literature, early development is the cat in the hat, Bugs Bunny, and Mickey Mouse. Those are three cornerstones in American literature. And one thing they all have in common is that they are the cornerstones of billion dollar industry. industry. Uh, Mickey Mouse is the cornerstone of a billion dollar industry called Walt Disney. Bugs Bunny is a cornerstone of a billion dollar industry called the Warner, the, uh, 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 Warner Brothers. And the cat in the hat is a part of a billion dollar industry of Random House and Hilton Mifflin. Random House was promoting him them through the bookstores, Hilton Mifflin to the school district. The reason why I mentioned those three characters, Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, and the cat in the hat, all three of them have one thing in common. They are doing the direct satire and they are throwing direct shade on the blacks because all three of them, when you see them, they have white gloves on. Those are a direct mimic of Al Jolson. And they are speaking to the subconscious mind of the people today. And the reason why us three are here, I say as an exception to the rule, is because we were able to escape a lot of that. And I think we need to speak out on it. And I try to speak out on it every time I get. And I'm focusing on black books and black boys because I always like to say, I'm not trying to tell us, they're trying to change the world. I'm at Pyramid Books. We're just trying to tell a story of a people who are in desperate need of change. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. I really appreciate it. And I'm very thankful for both of you for sharing your thoughts and your experiences, and more importantly, your time. Um, I would like us to continue this conversation even offline so that we could come up with some strategies so that we can do both, promote the library, promote the bookstore, and promote publishing in our community. I think that is very, very, very significant and important in this time. And again, I thank you all for joining us at this slow flow. 
South Florida Book Festival 2021. 10 years of programming to reach our community. Thank you all very much and good luck.